Okay, everybody. Good morning. I see there are still some people joining by way of uh, the waiting room, and uh, but I think we want to get going. I want to wish everyone a healthy, good, warm uh, Sunday morning here. Thank you so much for joining us in the third installment of uh, Seminary Shabbat. Uh, we began on Friday evening with a dialogue between Rabbi Witkowski and uh, Chancellor Eisen. Uh, yesterday I spoke to the history of the Jewish Theological Seminary and its relationship to Park Avenue Synagogue. And uh, this morning, we're honored to have a community dialogue uh, with Chancellor Eisen that we'll get into in just a moment. Uh, important as this weekend is uh, to uh, highlight, spotlight the relationship between JTS and Park Avenue Synagogue, I'd like to think that it is um, every day of the year. Uh, the uh, clergy, the educators, the scholarship uh, of the Jewish Theological Seminary informs all that we do and that so many synagogues across the country and across the world do each and every day. So it's kind of like how um, my mother uh, says every day is Mother's Day um, at Park Avenue Synagogue. Every day is JTS at PAS Day. It's just a matter of actually stopping to pause highlight it and affirm our commitment um, in, in personality, in funding, um, in all the different ways that we express our relationship. So I thank you um, in advance for being part of this. I look forward to a robust discussion uh, with the Chancellor. I thank you, Chancellor Eisen. I know it's not a quiet week for you. Um, and so uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us this morning. Um, the, the committee work uh, uh, under Rabbi Witkowski's leadership happens year round. And so uh, our committee member, Andrew Siegel, um, it's great to see you this morning um, to share words of welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Rabbi. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to say a few words about uh, JTS. My perspective as a member of the JTS at PAS committee as a JTS supporter and advisory board member, and actually as a student there, uh, which is really my favorite favorite part of uh, my interaction with, with JTS. And so I'd like to share, as both Rabbi Witkowski and Chancellor Eisen did during first uh, Friday night services, just so personally and lovingly, that for me too, JTS has made a profound impact on my life and my understanding of Judaism. Uh, and, and in conveying what I think JTS's achievements represent for all of us, uh, I, I recall a letter from Franz Rosenzweig to Hermann Cohen, in which Rosenzweig identified the need for a Jewish intelligentsia engaged in theological research. And that would be done best in, in dedicated institutions that plant and raise the spirit of Judaism. And Rosenzweig's vision for the future of Jewish learning was that the, the teacher and the scholar must become the same person. And I think of that because it's our JTS trained clergy at PAS that are such teacher scholars and JTS is such an institution. And as your remarks yesterday during seminaries, Shabbat so informatively reflected, so many of the great scholar teachers of our movement have been involved in some way uh, with JTS. Now I'm actually embarrassed to admit I'd never heard of JTS before I joined Park Avenue Synagogue. So I'm very grateful that the tie between the two institutions is so strong. It's personified to the present date, of course, by Aaron Allen Levine, who served on the board of trustees for 20 years and assumed the chairmanship of, of, of the board of uh, the seminary in 2015. I would urge members of the PAS community to explore how to make your own connection with JTS. So I wanna say one quick final word on that. Before I began making my frequent trips to campus as a student, I thought JTS was somewhere up there. And so I was reminded of the, the memorable scene in, in Parsha Mitzavim where Moses is teaching the Israelites how to love God. And he says that surely instruction is not too baffling, nor is it beyond reach. It isn't in the heavens, so the people would need to go up to heavens and get it, nor is it across the sea. He says, no, it's very close to you. Well, JTS is only across the park at 122nd and Broadway. It's a wonderful and warm neighborhood on the border of Columbia, and it's a very, very short distance from PAS. Um, and until uh, the beautiful new campus is open and we're comfortable getting back on the M4 bus, which literally goes door to door from PAS to JTS, 
JTS has multiple online lectures and classes for all of us to dip our toe into. Just go to jtsa.edu, click on community learning right there at the top of the page, uh, and you see what's available to all of us. So it's obvious that I could go on and on, uh, and I look forward to sharing my passion for JTS with anyone who has interest in learning more and getting involved. With that, I'm thrilled to hand the screen to my partner on the JTS at PAS committee, Ronnie Parker, to introduce today's esteemed guest. Thank you, Andrew. Arnold M. Eisen, one of the most foremost authorities on American Judaism, is the seventh chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Chancellor Eisen took office in 2007. Since that time, the relationship between the Jewish Theological Seminary and Park Avenue Synagogue has grown even closer, and we have been honored to welcome him to our Bima each year on Seminary Shabbat. This time will be the last that he speaks to us as chancellor. Last September, Chancellor Eisen announced that he would step down at the end of the academic year and would return to teaching and scholarship as a full-time member of the JTS faculty. During his tenure, Chancellor Eisen placed significant emphasis on strengthening Jewish learning in our communities, creating programs that extended the reach of JTS's scholarship and resources beyond the campus to Jewish learners around the world. Chancellor Eisen's other initiatives include the Block Kolker Center for Spiritual Arts, the Interfaith Center for Pastoral Education, the Hendel Center for Ethics and Justice, and the Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue. He presided over the rebuilding and revitalization of the JTS campus, a project we all look forward to seeing in person. The Bible says that God created the world in six days and rested on Shabbat, the seventh. Yaakov worked for Laban for seven years before he married each of Leah and Rachel. There are seven weeks of seven days in the counting of the Omer. The candlestick in the holy place of the tabernacle had seven branches. And seven priests carried seven shofarot and marched around the city of Jericho seven times on the seventh day. Chancellor Eisen, although you have completed your term at JTS's seventh chancellor, you are still contributing to the JTS, the, to, to the Jewish Theological Seminary and American Judaism in numerous ways, and always will be considered one of the great Jewish leaders of our time. We hope that after you return to the classroom, you will continue to visit, learn with, and pray with us here at Park Avenue Synagogue for many years to come. Ronnie, thank you. Uh, Rabbi, I mean, Chancellor, our committee chairs are quoting Torah and commentary and modern Jewish thought, and I think we should just sit down and let them do the rest of this. That was, that was incredible, both of you. Andrew and Ronnie, thank you so much. Um, so, hi, I am very honored and lucky to be here. This is sort of a dream of mine to have uh, two of my friends and mentors uh, locked into a Zoom where they can't go anywhere and I get to talk to them, and I'm glad that you're all here too. So uh, I think, um, Rabbi Chancellor, there's a lot on everyone's mind right now, and, and clearly we're gonna talk about what's going on in the world today. Um, but just to focus everyone on what I thought we would talk about today is specifically uh, the role of synagogues. I know, Chancellor, you're going to be speaking, I believe okay. next week, you're gonna be doing a, an, an online sort of talk about the changes in American Judaism and the conservative movement writ large over the course of your tenure as chancellor. And so today I thought um, instead of duplicating that, I wanna drill down on um, synagogue communities. And I wanna talk about the changing face of the shul. Uh, but to, to start, let's look back. And so I'm gonna ask uh, Rabbi, I'm gonna call you Rabbi and Chancellor right now. That's, those are your names. Uh, so. Um, same question to the two of you. Uh, guests go first, Chancellor Eisen. I just I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about what synagogue meant to you and your family growing up. Yeah, I think it's very perceptive to start there because as many books as one reads and books that one writes, the kind of emotional bonds one makes with Judaism and with the synagogue in particular as a child tend to be really important in, in one's development. And a lot of my thinking later on is trying to find greater meaning and intellectual rationale in the legacy I got from my parents as a kid running around the halls of my conservative synagogue in Philadelphia. So that's the most important thing to know. The synagogue was a home for me. We were there a lot. 
My, my parents were machers. I felt completely in place. The school building was connected to the sanctuary and during the synagogue service, I was 90%, I believe, running around the hallways with my friends, 10% in the synagogue service. And then there was junior congregation. And because my friend Barry had a better voice than I did, he got to be the leader of the junior congregation, but I got to be the rabbi of the junior congregation, which meant I got to announce the pages. To me, that's what a rabbi did. A rabbi announced the pages. And so synagogue for me was kind of a lifelong pursuit. And in coming to shul now, I am reliving reliving these memories of what I did as a kid week after week, year after year with my parents. So synagogue was a place where I was at home, where I knew that I was connected to something larger than myself. You don't, you don't formulate this intellectually, but you get it emotionally as a kid. And these bonds stay with you for life. Yeah. Uh, look, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful question, uh, Rabbi, because it, it's, uh, it speaks to the heart of the matter, which I, I could almost just uh, replace uh, Chancellor Eisen's words with my own. I, 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 though I'll one-up you, it, it, for me it started before I was even born, um, because my grandfather of blessed memory was a congregational rabbi. Um, now I never knew him, but I grew up with stories of what it was like for my father to grow up in his congregation. And so uh, as, as I've shared before with the community, um, nice Jewish boys, and it was boys at the time, grew up to be um, doctors uh, or, or lawyers or rabbis. Um, there is no story in, uh, in my life about when did Elliot find religion. Um, I, I have one brother who works for YouTube, another one who's, in, who's a movie producer. My parents think that's weird. No one in my family finds being a rabbi remotely interesting. The rabbi was a person who was um, at our Shabbos table, um, it, it was a close personal friend of my, I mean, not sort of in a formal way, like he was sitting in the room and he was just in the living room having a scotch with my dad as you know, we were all playing ball or doing whatever kid, there, there was no mystique about it. You, it. It was just, there's a postman, there's a fireman and there's a rabbi. It's how the neighborhood worked. Uh, and, um, and my experiences in the synagogue I grew up in were very similar. Uh, you know, uh, both my mother and my father very involved in their lay committees. Um, it continues to be the prism that I look at synagogue life Sometimes I'll be speaking to someone um, and I'll say, oh my gosh, that person who's a ritual director, um, ritual committee head, my dad had that position or you know, my mother had that position and that love and that respect and that appreciation of what synagogue life is all about and how it shapes identity um, is very much at the core of my being. Um, so much so that, uh, that I'll say, you know, I, the obituary of my grandfather, um, I once stumbled upon it in, in a clipping book. Um, he actually, he was in seat or whatever until whatever you can, in his pulpit until that very day uh, he died. Um, it said he, you know, the Reverend I.K. Cosgrove officiated at a funeral in the morning. He had a heart attack in the afternoon and he, w he was dead by Shabbos. Um, but um, I don't mean to over-dramatize it. I'm just talking about the nobility and beauty um, and commitment of um, serving a community all the way through as an expression of Jewish life and an expression of what it is to be a Jewish professional. Well, Rabbi, you sort of answered my, my next question as well, which was going to be about how you decided to don't make Don't worry, I can talk about anything. So you... you <laughs> I no, can't. this is no. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to our Chancellor. Uh, um, for you, as it may be, at least in your professional career, the idea of focusing on synagogues was, I mean, maybe focusing on synagogues academically was something that you had done uh, from from the sort of the outset. But how did you make the decision to? I guess essentially the question is to become Chancellor. But how did you make the decision to make sort of? communal synagogue Judaism professionally where you wanted to put your energy? 
So there, there, there are two reasons for that. Again, let's say the, the personal reason and the, the academic or intellectual reason. I, as soon as I came back to New York, uh, having finished graduate school uh, in Jerusalem and moved to the Upper West Side and began as it were my adult life as a young professor at Columbia University, I went in search of a shul. And I found a wonderful minion that at first was meeting in people's homes and soon moved into on Sheikh Hasid. And so synagogue was my personal anchor. And when my wife and I got married, that the minion made that marriage what it was and et cetera. So all through the years, synagogue has, has, had, has been that emotional as well as intellectual center for me. But the other reason is connected to my scholarship. So here I am a scholar of American Judaism, Judaism and I became convinced as a scholar of Judaism in the modern period, and especially in America, that the synagogue was the key institution for American Jewish life and the rabbi was the key leader for American Jewish life. And so when the vacancy of JTS chancellor um, came about, I started thinking, well, do I want to do this? Do I, I started thinking about it. My friends urged me to do it. And then let me mention him here, Gershon Kex, Gershon Kex said to me one day, well, you've been giving the Jewish community all sorts of advice. We don't need kibitzers, we need leaders. Come be a leader. In other words, come put your theories about Jewish life into practice as the head of an institution that trains Jewish leaders. That was an irresistible uh, possibility for me. And so when I became chancellor, it was very much with an eye to applying the lessons that I had learned in my scholarship. For example, just briefly, that if Judaism in the modern period is voluntaristic, that means it's a choice people make. It's not taken for granted. You can do it or not do it, and you can do it in a variety of ways. That means that we have to provide Jews with plausible, compelling options. We have to wrap them in things that they want to be part of. And that means that the two elements I've always stressed in my scholarship became the two elements that I've always stressed for the importance of synagogues. Number one, that they are communities, that you want to enfold people. Life can be very lonely, especially in an individualist society like America. You want to enfold people in a voluntary community that they want to be part of. And the second thing is you want to give them what I call capital M meaning, which they can't find elsewhere. Because you've got to offer them something that they can't get from the larger society. They can't get it on Broadway. What are you drawing them with? And so the synagogue seems to me to be the place with the greatest success, as well as the greatest opportunity, in giving Jews these two things of community and meaning, which is why when I've been chancellor, I've put my emphasis on training leaders, and among the leaders we train, the, the rabbis, it, it seems to me, along with educators and cantors, are the key leaders in Jewish life. Now, one also needs lay leaders, and that's why I'm thrilled that JTS has this college, and we need people like me to study the situation, so I want to train academics. But this trio of rabbis and cantors and educators grouped around synagogues is, I think, where the action in Jewish life is going to be. Right. I, do, I do think, just to build on uh, the chancellor's comment, right, we, we need to acknowledge how very countercultural a synagogue is. And, and I've spoken at length about this, that we're in an age of uh, disintermediation, uh, the very assumptions of how society is forming, um, the turn to our iPhones and uh, the manner by which we receive information, um, the manner by which, you know, all of these things, even before Corona, were up for grabs. Uh, and, you know, in a way, uh, not in a way, I, th I think synagogues are a contrarian bet. And uh, which is why um, and I might be obstinate, I'll, I'll be curious to know if we do, uh, Rabbi, open it up for Q&A, uh, how, how people feel about this. But um, at the very moment where there are fewer and fewer uh, opportunities, reasons, and modalities of forming uh, what sociologists call a thick sense of identity, um, synagogues are... Um, their, their mission is this virtuous cycle of uh, identity shaping, communal shaping events. So meaning where you educate your child is the same place where you go to um, pray, is the same place when you 
take a class is the same committee you serve on is the same place that you have your celebrations is the same place that you um, go perhaps on an Israel trip with your community. Um, it, it's not to say that we don't need our Met museums and our museums and, and our New York Historical Societies, right? These are all very important institutions. But um, what the Chancellor, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, but you're retiring in a month, so who cares? Okay. No, I'm teasing. Um, but, uh, you know, the, this, this cycle of, of identity formation is, is unique uh, to, to synagogues. And, and I think, um, and, we, and if I may, I think we see it every day at Park Avenue Synagogue. I, I see it in the lives of the people uh, on this very screen. It's, it's a differentiated place um, in the landscape of American Jewish life that has not run its course. Right, and, and if I could add, it's, it's countercultural in, in a very concrete way because we, we know from the study called Bowling Alone, which is already about 15 or 20 years old, I believe, that Americans are reluctant to join things. And if they join them, they're reluctant to stay for a long time. And the kind of institutions lately that they've been most reluctant to join are religious institutions. So that some synagogues are having trouble with membership. And, and I like to reassure them, well, you're part of a larger pattern here because Americans are not joining churches the way they used to. And if you're worried about the decline in membership in synagogues, the decline in membership in the Protestant church, including evangelical and fundamentalist Protestant churches, is way larger than the decline in membership in synagogues. And so we're swimming upstream when we're asking people to join something. And then as the rabbi said, to ask them to join something which wants to take on various parts of themselves. It's not just a, a fee for service that you want one specific thing and you pay for it and then you leave, but it offers you this kind of capital C community and capital M meaning. And that's an advantage for people who find there what they're looking for, but it can also be more than some people want. They, and they may want only peripheral involvement and, or they may want no involvement whatsoever. Like, don't, don't bother me, I'll come to you when I need you. And that's um, very countercultural in terms of the larger ethos of American society. So I think we're doing really well and a synagogue like Park Avenue Synagogue is doing fantastically well, given the context uh, in which we're operating. Thank you. I do want to make a, a note about questions, Rabbi, because you brought this up. Um, we are going to turn to questions a little bit later on, and I'll invite, if you'd like, you can private chat me your questions now, um, and that way I can sort of aggregate them and we can just go that way, or, or once we'll open it up, you can chat to to the group, but um, feel free to chat me as we go on. So um, let's talk for a second, Chancellor, you just ended up with talking about how we are doing this well. And, um, and I really appreciate what you're saying. Uh, so a, a past chancellor, I thought we could quote some past chancellors here. Um, a past chancellor of the seminary, uh, Gerson Cohen once wrote um, that his whole, his goal, wait, I can pull it up. Um, why that you instead of, you know, we, we say we take out the Torah, Kimi Tzion, Tetzay Torah, right? From, from Zion Jerusalem uh, comes Torah. Um, and he says, uh, I daily pray that we will come to say, Kimi New York, Tetzay Torah, Udavar Mi Los Angeles, uh, we will continue. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if you're, I guess my question for both of you is, what are we doing well in the synagogue world? And what of what we're doing well is uniquely um, American or uniquely modern that we have sort of adapted or changed uh, our synagogue life to be? If I, if I um, recall that essay correctly, right, it was a, um, it, it was a, it, the standpoint of the seminary, we have to have a differentiated version, you know, out of New York, out of Los Angeles, of uh, the whole point, the project of conservative Judaism is to um, uh, find the right balance, wh whether you want to talk about tradition and change or otherwise. Um, I, 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 something about your question, uh, Rabbi, you know, I, I, just as Shabbat was coming in, a classmate of mine, Josh Heller, um, wrote a tshuva, a rabbinic responsa for the conservative movement on the use of 
um, technology, um, Zoom, for during these times, right? And uh, how to balance the need for people to connect and, and engage with community, with prayer, with otherwise, and um, the, the parameters of halakha. I think um, that could only happen through the conservative movement. I think that's what Gershon Cohen of Blessed Memory, um, those, that kind of thinking is, um, is what it is. It's, it's not just to um, be a transmitter of, of tradition in a passive way, but it's to know that the project of Jewish leadership is to serve Jews and Judaism, to make Judaism come alive for each and every day and each and every generation. So um, if you want a case statement for the seminary and uh, the conservative movement, uh, then look at you know what Josh Heller wrote uh, just before Shabbat. Yeah, so Cohen was making the point, and he, he also was, you know, to my mind, famous for making the claim that my job is not to be a Jew on the banks of the Vistula, which is a river in Poland in the 18th century. My job and my privilege is to be a Jew on the banks of the Hudson in the 20th century. So he wanted Judaism to be meaningful to the Jews living where, where and as they were. And he understood that in Israel, the situation is very, very different because you speak Hebrew every day, you dream in Hebrew, the streets are Jewish, et cetera, et cetera. So being, going into a synagogue in the United States on a Shabbat when the rest of the world does not have Shabbat is a very different experience than going into a synagogue in Israel on Shabbat, even in Tel Aviv where the field is not quite what it is in Jerusalem, but it's still very, very different. So Cohen is giving us the challenge. So how are we going to give people this kind of meaning in the situation where they're living? And I would say one of the ways that synagogues who are, that, are, that have their act together do really well is with life cycle events and celebrations. So your morning, there, there is just no comparison to what the Jewish community offers in terms of support for those who grieve and those who mourn with Shiva and Kaddish and Yorza, et cetera, et cetera. It's a rich, a very rich heritage of meaning that the synagogue provides. I went to a Zoom bris the other day. So to have people gathered from around the world to celebrate the birth of new life in the midst of all of this suffering and death, it's a really meaningful moment and Judaism frames that moment. So let, let's say we know zooming out from the particulars of Jews, that the most meaningful thing in the lives of contemporary Americans, I suspect it's not just Americans, are interactions with children and grandchildren. And if you don't have close family of your own, it's with your extended family or with your very close friends. And so Judaism excels in these life cycle moments that synagogues deliver from birth all the way through death with lots of stops in between. I can count up the number of meaningful moments in my life, and I assume that everyone watching can, can do the same. And those moments are, are almost to, a, to, to an event highlighted by, by Jewish meaning, bar and by mitzvah of my kids, and wedding, and the deaths of my parents, and my own marriage, et cetera, et cetera. And these become Jewish events that are synagogue celebrations, synag synagogue events. So we're doing that really well. I mentioned pastoral care. And so the synagogues that, that have their act together are offering pastoral care, which is why we now make this a required part of the training of every rabbinical student at JTS. Synagogues offer this amorphous thing that we can't define, but it's really real called spirituality. And we know it's there and we know the contemporary people look for it. They want it in their lives and they can get it at synagogue. There's this part of them that synagogue reaches that the technological, impersonal, bureaucratic society out there does not reach in the same way. And a synagogue enables you to come in off the street on a Friday afternoon as the sun begins to set and, and feel a part of yourself that you know is there, but which the rest of the world does not help you get in touch with. And there you are because of synagogue. So I, I think there are, there, are, there are a bunch more things like this. I'll just mention one more, which is that we want to make the world better. We want, we want to find meaning in life by helping to improve the lives of other people. We want to leave the world better than we found it. 
And so the role of the synagogue in doing social justice work here in the United States or in Israel, that job of the synagogue in improving the justice in the world, that's also a very important success story for synagogues that, that have taken this on as a task. And that's why we set up a Center for Justice and Ethics at JTS, so that our rabbinical students and others would be trained in how to help synagogues do this. So Ethan, I, I think there's a, a lot of things that synagogues are doing well, and good lay leadership and good professional leadership working together put these things in place, and the, the results are out there. The results are empirically proven that synagogues that do their job in providing meaning and community in this way, if they have a reasonable demographic, are thriving. I do, um, I agree with everything the chancellor said. Uh, and that the synagogue is, plays all these functions and it's there to tell us um, how the world should be, not how the world is, right? Whatever that uh, pithy uh, maxim is to, to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Uh, but uh, just to stir things up a little, uh, I, I do just want to name the elephant in the room that all is not right with synagogue life. Uh, we live in a bubble uh, at Park Avenue Synagogue where the combination of um, demography and philanthropy uh, engagement, um, we are, um, uh, we have, as I say, my problems are problems that most people would give their right arm for. Uh, and when you think about communities across, whether it's in Long Island and New Jersey or in, uh, you know, wherever, um, um, Milwaukee and Pittsburgh, uh, the, this is not the tale. The tale of Park Avenue is not the tale. And so for me, and this entire process has been accelerated over the last uh, couple months is to figure out what the baskets that the chancellor is talking about, right? The differentiated value added of synagogue and recognize that the modality of how that is happening has been in need and on steroids now is in need to be reconsidered. So for me, the language I use is that it's a, it's a Beit Knesset, a house of community, it's a Beit Tefillah, a house of prayer, and it's a Beit Midrash, um, a house of study. Everything else sort of falls into those three rubrics. Okay, so we can go from the mundane to, to you know, the, the, the philosophical, whatever, but the, you know, what does membership look like, right? Um, the idea um, that you cut a check once a year um, for synagogue membership um, might not be working in that it might it works for us but it doesn't work for other communities what would it look like to have a Spotify sort of subscription for content that sort of flipped a model of membership uh, to a, a subscription model what would it look for a hybrid model what's it going to look like if, if things are happening online and offline um, what about um, Jewish education um, it, we, we at Park Avenue Synagogue, if you have children there, we have um, a, a, a robust sort of Hebrew tutorial uh, at uh, addition, additive portion of our, of our curriculum. So our kids' um, Hebrew skills can be up to snuff. Um, is that necessary that that part of the curriculum happens uh, in person? Maybe there's an in-class part and there is a Zoom part of what it means to educate a child um, and we're thinking in different ways. I think it's incumbent upon, I, I can go through every service of the synagogue, not service as in prayer service, but every um, aspect of synagogue life and say, we need to um, look at the art of the possible. Um, and I think uh, given Park Avenue where we are, I think that we can actually lead that conversation in partnership with JTS of um, what, what could synagogue -like life look like in the places that are struggling. And um, frankly, I think we'll be struggling even more uh, once we, um, as we take steps forward in this unprecedented time. 
Right. So I could just add that to that briefly. The, the virus came upon us suddenly and without anybody that I know predicting that it was going to happen has completely upended and transformed the world in ways that we're going to talk about in a second in relation to the synagogue. I believe since I came to JTS that we were in the midst of a period of great transformation. Um, and this has just proven what, one more example of that transformation. We have artificial intelligence, which is remaking so many fields. We have gene editing, which is going to transform the nature of species and perhaps the human species. We've got a geopolitical situation in the world which is changing. We are very closely tied to Israel and the, and the Middle East is up for grabs. So there, there are so many changes going on and therefore the, the notion of tradition happening through change, that change happening in the framework of a tradition, this tradition and change model of conservative Judaism, as, as the rabbi said, in steroids is what we're living through and therefore when you wanna prepare Jewish leaders for this situation, you want to make them as rooted in their tradition as possible so that they can let their imaginations fly and take wing, knowing that they're rooted, that they're not going to abandon the tradition because it's in them, it, it, lives, in, it lives and breathes in them, and, and give them license and, and empower them to make the kind of changes that are necessary to keep the tradition vital. Now, I, I just want to mention one more hard part because I, I, don't, want, I don't want people to blame synagogues entirely for their failings, I want people to appreciate how much synagogues have to deal with what the rabbi called a countercultural situation. And we haven't mentioned this, this other way in which synagogues are perhaps countercultural, and that is that synagogues have to do with God. And God is not an easy subject, doesn't trip off the tongue of contemporary American Jews, and it does not help us that when one hears the word religion in this culture, one immediately thinks of fundamentalists. One immediately thinks of people that are not like one. One immediately thinks of people who are denying that modernity and, and religion can be synthesized the way that conservative Judaism insists that they can be synthesized. So the fact that the synagogue is a house of prayer and that prayer does not come easily to the great majority of American Jews, one can make that statement without qualification. Prayer does not come easily. And yet one can also say that the great majority of American Jews believe in some divine force. They're not materialists. They're not militant atheists. They, they know, that they, they, they want to be in touch with, they want to encounter God in some way. And synagogue is there to help them do that. But it's hard. And um, therefore, when I, when I see synagogues struggling, I try to understand, well, what is it that they're up against and how can they overcome this vast cultural gap between the secular world that most of us inhabit for most of our lives, most of every day and every week, and the synagogue, which is trying to offer a different view of reality. And it's not simple. And uh, I think the, the virus that's upon us has just made us aware again of how much we need community and how difficult it is to find this community and how much we need capital M meaning to get through a situation of suffering and and death and tribulation, and how difficult it is to find meaning to grab hold of, and hence the importance of the synagogue. Thank you. Um, I just, I do want to say, uh, this isn't about me, but I just, Chancellor, one of the things you said really resonated with my experience at JTS as a place that really just gave us such a solid footing in the tradition um, sometimes I think actually blessedly without thinking about how it could be applied, but just learning, 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 uh, and then put it to us to, you know, be steeped in that tradition so that when we went out into the world, we were better prepared to imagine and create and adapt. Um, so that I just wanted to point that out as just something that uh, JTS has done and continues to do just tremendously well. Um, I have I have one one more question for you for me before I open up and everyone's been typing some pretty great questions we might not get a chance to go to all of them but we will we'll talk about some of them so um, 
Uh, there's been a, a growing part of the public discourse. Uh, I'm thinking right now about articles that have come out from Ezra Klein from Vox and uh, something recently in The New Yorker about um, the space that religion has left in the American conversation. Um, and, and as as this sort of um, uh, the, the liberal Protestant and Jewish movements kind of step out uh, uh, or reduce their imprint in the sort of moral sphere of American society, which we can, maybe you'll disagree with that premise, but uh, that, that's, that's sort of being filled in with um, politics as an ideology, as a, as a religion of itself, right? Whichever side of the political world you're on, um, but that, uh, that, that we as sort of the kind of public religious figures have been seeding ground uh, on, in the moral capacity or being the moral center. And I, I wanted to hear um, the two of you, I've actually kind of always wanted to ask you this privately, but now I get to ask you publicly. Um, what, do you agree with that idea? And if so, um, how, should we stop it? How do we step back into uh, a part of society we've maybe let, let slip a little bit? So let me say what I have to say briefly, because there are more questions, because I haven't formulated this, and because what I'm about to say, uh, Mavin Yavin, it's charged. I think we are in a moral wilderness right now. Um, I'll just use a case in point. Think about the elevated position of Andrew Cuomo right now. Um, for he's, he's a flawed leader, just like every other leader. But the reason why people are paying attention is because there's a vacuum of a moral voice from the, let's call it the, the traditional um, points of moral leadership. Um, and the effect of that rabbi is that I think never before has it been more important um, for uh, religious leaders to speak with clarity um, and um, frequency uh, to the issues of our day. Um, I think there's a vacuum and I think that um, for all that is changing right now, the idea of JTS developing rabbinic leadership um, or leadership in general um, capable of, of arming uh, its graduates uh, with the ability to speak to this, the issues of the day has never been more urgent. Thank you. That's why we were really excited to set up the Center for Justice and Ethics, the Handel Center for Ethics and Justice that, that took, uh, took wing last year because we want to give our students a voice. And I, Rabbi Witkowski, I have to agree with your premise. I really do. I think that there's, 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 we've been too quiet. And part of we've been, we've been too quiet because people are afraid that if they venture into the world, the public square, they're gonna be squashed. They're gonna to be told by some congregants, we're leaving, this is not a place to talk about politics. My, my stance on this, has always been to tell students, number one, you speak from the Jewish tradition. You speak out of Jewish history and text. You don't speak out of the party platforms of this or that political organization. You speak out of the tradition in the name of the tradition. And number two, you speak about moral issues. So sometimes politics and morality overlap. Our job is to speak out of the tradition in a moral voice. And one can't simply say religion is a good thing it's hard to unite with all religious leaders because they're religious leaders whose notions are, are pernicious to me. There are religious leaders out there who are saying that God sent this virus to punish us for one or another transgression, which they're only too happy to name. So they've got this secret channel into God's motivation and they can tell you why God is sending this virus to kill hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people because God wants to teach the world a lesson. That's pernicious. There are religious leaders out there who think that terrorism is just fine. Thank you very much. It's okay to kill men, women, and children because we're fighting a crusade here for virtue. But I, I can't stand side by side with, with that notion of religion. So one can't defend religion as such, but one can defend the necessity of of people of faith standing up and saying, look, God demands justice, God demands compassion. You may disagree with me, but this is with all humility. This is what I think the times demand. And I, I think you're right that people are crying out for that kind of voice. And we can't let the politicians have a monopoly on the discourse. People look to us to bring in the wisdom of this tradition. 
we've got a lot of wisdom to offer here and it's our job to offer it better than we have been. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we've, we've started to get into uh, answering some of the, the questions that have been popping up. And so I'm going to turn to some of your questions, everyone. Thank you for sending them to me and, and for putting them in the chat. Um, so one question I want to, uh, I'm going to double two together. So one question, we're going to go back into the weeds a little bit on, on synagogue life. And that is, um, Rabbi, you sort of made an allusion to this with your, your Spotify subscription model, which is interesting. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that was a new policy proposal you just made, uh, but- um, not, not for Park Avenue, but for other communities. <laughs> but uh, uh, um, I'm gonna make music jokes right now, but I'm not, I wanna ask. So, I mean, I guess the question to both of you are two, twofold. One is, are there new ways you're thinking about synagogues addressing um, the financial need um, uh, of its community members, which is uh, unfortunately probably going to be much more prevalent in the months um, and years to come, both in a model of how we operate and ask for people's uh, resources, as well as what we do to help the members of our community. Um, and, and I want to I want to add on to that and you can, uh, you can choose which one, but there was also a question about, are there ways that you think that the larger synagogues um, like Park Avenue, for example, can, can help uh, smaller synagogues uh, maybe elsewhere in the, in the country or even smaller synagogues around the corner? Um, I don't know if those are directly yeah, linked. Or no, not, are, are, I, I understand why they're interrelated. So look, number one is Park Avenue, uh, like I say, functions in, in a pretty unique uh, landscape. So on the one hand, um, we are a synagogue um, with amazing resources and membership. On the other hand, like any synagogue, there are people on dues assistance and for whom uh, educating children, synagogue membership, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think those numbers are only going to grow um, in, in to come. So the, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, the, the fact is that I spend a lot of my time, um, uh, if, if I may, um, making sure that there is no aspect of Jewish life out of reach for those who want it. Um, and that means a lot of phone calls to a lot of people. Um, it's what a rabbi does. It's what a chancellor does to fund scholarships, to fund other programs, dues assistance. Um, and that's a role I play and the lay leadership of the synagogue play. I do think to the second part of your question, I think this is, there's actually an article on e-Jewish philanthropy today. Um, I haven't read it yet, but I saw the headline of it, which is that if all summer camps are canceling right now, um, why do we have to be duplicative of all efforts to engage Jewish youth over the summer? Couldn't there be a consortium model between JTS, HUC, synagogues, camping systems, um, that um, we can all sort of work together. Um, I think that sort of thinking is necessary right now. Um, it is great that we are hiring, uh, like, I'll give you one example. We have a Jewish Lives um, book series. Uh, we're um, delighted to do it. We were gonna do it anyway, um, but we're gonna do it with United Synagogue. Um, and that way, uh, Park Avenue is taking the lead um, in, all the ways it means to take the lead, but it means that if you're in Detroit or if you're in Houston or if you're in whatever, and you're hearing the author speak about the new Jewish Lives book on X, um, there's a sharing of resources um, that com less resource communities can participate in that same venture. I think JTS, if I may, Chancellor, I think you, you know that business is bust and open right now. Um, the idea of um, shared resources um, to help flatten everything. Yeah, I could say that just in the last few weeks, the, uh, the adult education offerings that we put online have been drawing hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of people beyond our wildest expectations because people are home with time, but, and there's a need for this connection and a need for this meaning right now. So I think 
You're right. That's the future. We're both reading the literature. We're all reading literature about how the world is not going to go back to be what it was before the virus when, when we all get through this. And that's certainly true of higher education. Once higher education goes online for a significant part of itself, we don't need as many campuses. We don't need as many faculty. We don't need as many of anything. We're going to be able to reach more people with less. And the question is whether this model will come to be part of synagogue life. I would anticipate that even after we go back to meeting in person, we are also going to, going to have people zoom in. We're going to have people join us from a distance and that will change the nature of synagogues. And it may mean that some synagogues become satellites of other larger synagogues. It's, it's up for grabs. And I think uh, it, it's too fluid and open right now to predict what's going to happen. But it seems a safe prediction to say that we're on the way to some significant changes. Our, our problem for some years has been a scarcity of resources. Jewish life is very expensive. And a lot of people want to be part of Jewish life and can't because it just costs too much to join a synagogue and send a kid to school and send a kid to camp, let alone a day school, et cetera, et cetera. The, the cost is too, too hard to bear. And a lot of synagogues are facing financial difficulties in part because they have to maintain huge campuses. They have large buildings which are empty much of the time. And so more and more, especially as we emerge from the virus, it's going to be apparent that we can't afford to have all these buildings and it's less and less necessary to have all these buildings. So I think we're, we're seeing kind of changes that are already underway that are going to accelerate. I think most of you will know that the conservative movement in North America is in process of reorganization and consolidation right now. And that is all to the good. We're gonna have hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings in, in personnel costs and in, in back office costs, et cetera, et cetera. And the more we can do together as one movement, and then as the rabbi just said, the more we can do together with other movements, the more we'll be able to provide more people at less cost. And I think this is, this is an inevitable, inevitable outcome of the crisis we're now in. All right, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. I'm gonna take one, uh, I, I knew, you know, when I tried to bring chancellors to you, I, that's out of my league and in yours, so I'm gonna go Talmud. Um, so Resh Lakish in the Gemara in the Talmud says that anyone who has a synagogue in their neighborhood and doesn't go there to pray is called an evil neighbor. And I, I'm using that to uh, not berate everyone who, who's here being a good neighbor right now, um, but to ask you as you think about the idea of growing and looking forward, to what extent are we, um, should we be trying to provide um, internal reshaping of what we offer our members um, and to what extent is it the role of synagogues to do the outreach um, to whether it's to younger generations who increasingly seem to want their own niche communities and not be a part of larger institutional communities or um, or outreach to any demographic that isn't currently involved in synagogue life, um, but to say that the synagogue is the way of doing outreach to those groups, or do we leave that to um, some of the dedicated outreach communities that we have uh, and, and have them sort of train people up to bring them into synagogue life? All right, let's have some fun here, Chancellor, with our student. Sheilat Chacham Chatzichuva, the question of a wise person is half the answer. Ethan, answer your own question. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that as soon as I saw you smile, Rabbi. Uh, so what do you think, Ethan? You have committed a huge amount of your rabbinate to outreach, to bridging um, the membership of Park Avenue and the children, both literally and figuratively. Um, what do you see? I, I think when it comes to youth, the, the, the question of young, young people and their interest, I actually think that they want to be a part of multi-generational communities. I think that they, they, are, they, they want to have um, programming or, or groups that they know they're going to be able to show up to and just see people their age or, or, or you know, and, and, and again, there's different groups that we're talking about here. There's in, in New York City, we have huge groups of people in their 20s who are still trying to, um, or, or, or 30s, form their family relationships. There's also huge groups of young families looking for community. And, and I think that they do actually want to be a part of intergenerational communities. 
Um, but that is a huge drain on synagogue resources to be to spend time going out there to 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 do what they need to bring them in. Once they're in, they love to be a part of it. Um, but uh, but to bring them in, it, you know, again, Park Avenue is is fortunate that we have had. Um, not that you've had me, but that you've had someone in my position who is who has as part of their portfolio going out and doing that work. And not every synagogue um, has the ability to do that. So I think that, I mean, that, so I think that it's gonna be both, but I do think, I, I, I wanna echo what both of you have said, I still think that the synagogue is the best vehicle for meaning and community that the American Jewish community has to offer. And I think that that, you know, for all that Chabad or or the you know conservative versions of Chabad or new outreach groups do, I think that people that the synagogue is still the place that can offer people meaning in the in the best way. But now you guys have to answer the question. <laughs> so you can, let me let me put a theory to practice. One of the most important paragraphs that I believe we studied together in our history of conservative Judaism class was the paragraph where Mordechai Kaplan announces in 1934 that the formation of the American synagogue was a function of the fact that this was a Protestant country and you can't really suit, fit Jews neatly into a straitjacket modeled on Protestant churches because we are not just a religious group, we are a people. And a people is a network of communities. And therefore, what Kaplan wanted was communal organizations that combined the best of synagogues with the best of what it is to be part of a community. Now, that's been difficult. And partly it's been difficult because of the room that American society gives us. So we have our synagogues and our JCCs and our federations and our fraternal organizations, et cetera, et cetera. But because of what Kaplan said, which I believe is true, that we are not just a religious group, we are a people, we are a set of communities, we have to reach out and be as inclusive as we can. So we are limited by resources and personnel. We can only do what we can do. But in principle, we should all be reaching out and trying to serve as many Jews as we can in as many ways as we can, because when all is said and done, we're not just here to do tefillah. We're here to do much more than that, and that's in the name of Judaism. Judaism tells us that we're a people. Thank you. Um, I, think, uh, I'm, I think we're running out of time, so I want to say something chutzpahdik and provocative at the end, uh, which is, um, first of all, to wish, it's not provocative, to wish Mazal Tov um, and Chazak Uvaruch to Chancellor Eisen for all his leadership um, but I think, Ethan, in answer to your question, um, I think that there are going to be um, some tough conversations to come in the organized Jewish world. And I think that um, these, no one, no one likes to be on the board that puts themselves out of business. Um, and I think that um, these questions that we're alluding to in the last 10 minutes of this conversation about uh, what will stay and what will go, where opportunities for growth are and where opportunities for consolidation may be, um, are, are very complicated and they have to do with legacy institutions and they have to do with uh, egos and funding sources and all sorts of things. And I think that um, Chancellor Eisen, if I may, I hope that you indulge and grant yourself a well-deserved opportunity to reflect back that you should enjoy the fruits of your labors and know that you've left American Jewry in stronger shape than you found it. Um, I also hope that you use your unique position right now uh, to share um, not just because of your position but because of your appreciation for the arc and transformations of American Jewry um, to um, name the transformation we are presently in and from a position of love and investment, um, share your thoughts on the necessary transformations uh, that American Jewry needs to take in order to arrive at its next chapter in strength. 
Amen. Shabbat Shalom, Musaf is on page 184. We, uh, sorry, it's a little inside rabbi joke, everyone. Um, so we're, I'm going to close with a, a final quote from another chancellor um, uh, by, uh, by way of thanking you both and everyone who's here. So Louis Finkelstein uh, once wrote that in his youth, he wished that he had lived in the time of the Mishnah and that he had been a part of the project of building rabbinic Judaism um, because that was a huge, uh, if not a tremendous sea change in our people. Um, and, and so he, then he writes, but now I realize uh, that as we stand in our day today, we all hear the prophet Isaiah's words, who will go and who shall I send? And, uh, and I answer, here I am, send me. And so I want to thank um, Rabbi Cosgrove, and I want to thank Chancellor Eisen, uh, two people who have been sent and who have chosen to serve our people and our community um, with valor and with intellect. And, uh, and so thank you. Thank you for what you do for our community, as well as for being here this morning to talk with us. Um, I want to also acknowledge, I see on, we have Rabbi Zelizer is here. Um, and so thank you, Rabbi, for your service to JTS, as well as to the community um, and the Jewish people. And Alan Levine, I think, is here, uh, chairman of the board of JTS and past chairman of Park Avenue. Uh, I also saw Susan Zedek, and I see Nan Rubin, um, all uh, leaders in the JTS at PIS community, in addition to Andrew and Ronnie. So Thank you for all of the work that you do. Um, we're going to be uh, following this up. Uh, we, we've been recording this as well as everything we've done for JTS at PAS uh, Shabbat weekend, and we'll make those available. Um, we will also include in the email making those available a link to uh, help continue to support JTS uh, in all of the work that they are doing to meet the moment and to train leaders to create community and meaning and and be the leaders that we're going to need in this new world uh, as all of us face another sea change in the Jewish people and we'll face it well and we will face it together and uh, Rabbi Cosgrove and <coughs> you aren't going anywhere so you're going to help us face it as well uh, thank merciful heaven um, thank you all so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to spend the morning with you, and uh, we wish you well and have a Shavuot Tov, a wonderful week. Thank you.